Act Out is 100% independent, non-corporatized news. And that means we don't get any corporate cash. We depend on viewers like you to help keep us going. So to become a patron, visit patreon.com slash act out. This week on Act Out, we only have 10 years left before climate change kills us all. What's your plan? Come with us as we dive into climate change nihilism, hope, and how individual choices are the last things that we need to be focusing on as doomsday looms ahead. Next up, the federal government is over. But dry your eyes, friends, it's for the best. Human evolution, math, geography, and Cal Exit explain why. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to Act Out. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your tipping point. We're all fucked. Just give up, give up, turn this off, and just say fuck it. There's no use in fighting. Just grab a bottle of scotch and sit back with your loved one like it's a Cialis commercial. But instead of a sweeping vista of trees and a breathtaking sunset, you'll literally be watching the world burn. Or that's the perspective that Professor Guy McPherson of University of Arizona has with regards to climate change. Yeah, this now infamous doom and gloomer basically does interviews and writes articles on how we are absolutely, positively, beyond a shadow of a doubt, fucked. The man's blog is called Nature Bats Last, with the sub-headline, Our Days Are Numbered, Passionately Pursue a Life of Excellence, which sounds a bit like a self-help conference for end-of-day Christians, but for McPherson, his doom and gloom is scientific. According to McPherson, the problem with other estimations of how long we have left before a sixth great extinction is that they're based on one or two of the greatest issues. Arctic ice melt, the acidification of the ocean, extreme weather. While McPherson claims that he is looking at everything as a complete and very fucking depressing big picture. He basically posits that humanity has 10 years or even less before the Earth will no longer support human life. And no, there's nothing, absolutely nothing that you can do about it, not even hope. And I quote, I think hope is a horrible idea. Hope is wishful thinking. Hope is a bad idea. Let's abandon that and get on with reality instead. Let's get on with living instead of wishing for the future that never comes. I encourage people to pursue excellence, to pursue love, to pursue what they love to do. I don't think these are crazy ideas, actually. And I also encourage people to remain calm because nothing is under control. Certainly not under our control, anyway. And while control is out of the question, you can still prep for the end of days via his website. You can contact him as a consultant for his, quote, comprehensive set of durable living arrangements in response to the ongoing collapse of the industrial economy and global climate change. Not only is he a doomsdayer, he's one that has a kit that can be yours, too, for what I assume is a nominal fee. He's also a certified grief recovery specialist because apparently it's dawned on him that his prophecies are just shy of fucking debilitatingly depressing. On his site, next to a large box that asks whether or not you're contemplating suicide, he advocates that people, quote, live urgent urgently with death in mind. Peruse at your own peril. Now, why am I bringing this up? Am I standing here saying that I too think that we have 10 years or less on a beautiful planet? And that those 10 years will likely be filled with mayhem as, as the reality of our situation comes crashing down on us like an avalanche of crumbling ice from a prematurely melting glacier? No. I am, however, also not going to stand here and say that we have all the time in the world to figure our shit out, because that's not true either. If you recall from our interview with climate scientist Paul Beckwith in episode 107, shit's serious. And we are already too far along to stop the effects of climate change. The best we can do now is to try and mitigate and take aggressive and indeed global action to save ourselves and any other species that we might be taking down with us. See, the problem with McPherson's theory, besides the fact that he seems to be the only one backing it, is that it promotes some sort of active yogic nihilism, 
Everything is meaningless and going to shit, but while we're here, hug someone and then blow your savings on a trip to India. It also assumes that the work of bettering our situation, be it through racial equality work, environmental work, health care work, what have you, is only so that someone 70 years from now will benefit from it. Giving a fuck about the world you live in isn't just about the far-off future, it's about the here and now. Because in the end, even if it's 10,000 years from now, everything will ultimately be pointless. At some point down the road, the sun will swallow the earth and that no one and nothing will care about the empires, the conquered, or the conquerors. It will all be equal dust. So does that mean that we should live like we're already there? Like that ultimate meaninglessness of existence is our creed now? What's the span of time threshold where you start applying meaning to life? When you can start to give a fuck? Is it 20 years? 25? I mean, let's just say that McPherson is right. How many lives would be better today and for the next 10 years if that pipeline didn't go through? If that oil refinery doesn't get built? If Monsanto doesn't just get to poison us at will? If McPherson really wanted people to pursue excellence, again, whatever the fuck that means, he'd say, fight. Fight for a better life for the people and the time that you have. Exist in the now, in your place and your time, and engage with it. Don't escape from it. Be a pain in the ass for the corporate goons so that their last living breaths are spent agonizing over what assholes we are, as opposed to quietly signing off after ten years spent in peaceful bliss, oppressing and extracting without as much as a whisper of resistance. As Huey P. Newton wrote in his book Revolutionary Suicide, although I risk the likelihood of death, there is at least the possibility of changing intolerable conditions. This possibility is important because much in human existence is based upon hope without any real understanding of the odds. And that is why hope does matter. McPherson is doing what many do and that is confuse hope with optimism. I have no optimistic ideas that humanity will definitely unfuck the world in time for us to beat back the worst of climate change, but I have hope. And a vehement unwillingness to throw my hands up and let my years tick by while the powers that be torture people and planet for profit. And whether McPherson's suggestion is as trustworthy as the other end of dayers who see Jesus in their morning toast, or just a very extreme theory on a spectrum of cold fact, is unclear, and indeed secondary to this point. Climate change is here, it's our fault, and the only way that we can hope to mitigate it and the associated collapse of capitalism for however long we have left is through real, powerful, widespread action and resistance. And I'm sorry to say that that does not include, or just include, recycling. In a recent article in The Guardian, Martin Lukak ex Lukacs explains how neoliberalism's pedestaling of corporate power at the expense of people and planet has made us believe that the onus is on us as individuals alone to protect the environment. Large-scale efforts to rein in and regulate emissions, spills, leaks, and more have been systematically crushed. And as you hit yourself for buying a plastic water bottle at the airport because TSA has an irrational fear of reusable water bottles, just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions. Yeah, 100. And does that mean that you should just say fuck recycling and let's buy a Hummer? No, because that sort of thinking is exactly the type of hopeless, laissez-faire, nihilist bullshit that McPherson is peddling, and it helps no one. It's vehemently selfish and incidentally exactly what the powers that be want. Lukacs writes, even before the advent of neoliberalism, the capitalist economy had thrived on people believing that being afflicted by the structural problems of an exploitative system, poverty, joblessness, poor health, lack of fulfillment, was in fact a personal deficiency. Neoliberalism has taken this internalized self-blame and turbocharged it. It tells you that you should not merely feel guilt and shame if you can't secure a good job, are deep in debt, and are too stressed or overworked for time with friends. You are now also responsible for bearing the burden of potential ecological collapse. It's not about avoiding the choices that make your life more green. It's about putting them in the appropriate context. 
If you have the money to live completely green, i.e. afford to buy a house, which then in turn has solar panels and a beekeeping garden, or you have the money to buy organic to fill your office with air cleaning plants or the chairs made out of recycled silicone from vegan non-GMO life coaches, do it. But know that a lot of that is an economic privilege purposefully made unattainable to the vast majority of people through the constructs of capitalism. And your ability to make it work for you does not unfuck climate change. And you should be doing more. This is one of my favorite cartoons because it not only speaks to that brand of blinders on do-gooder that checks save the world off their list with every new green gadget, but also speaks to how capitalism has made a market out of our guilt and our slow suicide. I mean, that is pretty damn ingenious. Instead of reliable and clean mass transportation, we're sold a Prius and told we're doing our part. Instead of food sovereignty, we're urged to pay more for organic and let Monsanto just be Monsanto. Instead of viable alternatives to dirty energy, mass-produced, cruelty-filled food and stuff, we're told to never mitigate our spending, but to instead spend more on shit that has a smiling bunny on it or a picture of a brown-skinned person with a handful of coffee beans. But as Lukacs so succinctly puts it, eco-consumerism may expiate your guilt, but it's only mass movements that have the power to alter the trajectory of the climate crisis. This requires us first, a resolute mental break from the spell cast by neoliberalism, to stop thinking like individuals. It means fuck that nihilistic shit about giving up and living in your own refried bean filled bunker for the next 10 years. It means fuck thinking that a re reusable tote totes means that you're an environmental activist. It means joining the movements that are already working hard to unfuck climate damage and to fuck up large scale corporate plans for more. It means becoming ungovernable and working on the alternatives that serve community and planet, not just you and your closest relatives. It means working locally and creating broad networks of solidarity across cities, states, countries, and the world. And it means doing this for five years, 10 years, and however long you have after that. Because when it comes down to the nitty gritty, we don't know. I could get hit by a bus tomorrow, and then that 10-year window means really fuck all to me. I could plan for the 10-year window and then be shit out of luck at the 11-year mark, realizing that I wasted 10 years of my life caring only about my own life excellence. Again, what the fuck does that mean? We may have missed the boat on stopping climate change. That fucker sailed maybe around the last time that the Salton Sea actually saw a real boat. But until we are dust on that pale blue dot, we have never missed the boat on giving a fuck and doing something. Not just for future generations, but for each other in the here and now, our time, our place. And if I am still around when this time comes, perhaps, as was the case with Indiana Jones, I can get to see the fascists melt first. I mean, one can hope, right? Now, speaking of smaller scale organizing initiatives, the federal government is an anachronism. And by that, I simply mean that the scale to which this representative system works with and for the people is not only a farce, but ultimately it's unsustainable. Human beings don't do well in vast empires. What it takes to govern 300 million people over 3,000 3, miles across is in short, the assertion of control. Your senators don't give a flying fuck about you because they don't know who you are. They have no idea. They sit on committees that make sweeping decisions for not only your state, but every state. They don't even read legislation that they vote on because it's too long and they don't have or take the time. Human interest stories are plucked with precision from their home states and towns, but that pipeline will still get their vote because your backyard is not their backyard. Your water is not their water, and your concerns are absolutely not theirs. And while we may superficially come together and wave a flag and a sparkler once a year, there is no American community. There can't be. We're just too divided and conquered. Indeed, as James Madison wrote in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, 
Divide et impera, or divide and conquer, the reprobated axiom of tyranny is under certain qualifications the only policy by which a republic can be administered on just principles. He goes on to point out that with westward expansion, the goal of dividing and conquering is made that much easier. And some 230 years later, it's quite clear that his points have been proven. As outlined in the previous segment, neoliberalism's goal was to make us individuals and not citizens. And it turns out that the American stage was one hell of a place to put that on play. Our brains are simply not hardwired to work on a scale that large. If you're familiar with Dunbar's number, you'll know that studies show that human beings work best in smaller groups of at most 150 people. Beyond that point, hierarchical systems inevitably take root because people find it difficult to interact on that large of a scale in a structurally flat and fluid way. Well, 300 is doubly tricky for us humans. What the fuck is 300 million? Now, of course, we can, and some are already manifesting smaller groups of community organization and neighborhood councils. But the question is, is there a way to push that regional movement forwards by implementing the S word, secession? Now, secession gets a bad rap because of, you know, the Civil War. But this idea is something that isn't just for white supremacist bigots who don't like doing manual labor. Last week, the California State Attorney General signed off on a ballot measure for the California secession movement. <clears throat> and this means that they can now begin gathering signatures to qualify for the 2018 ballot. The initiative would form a commission to recommend avenues for California to pursue its independence and delete part of the state constitution that says it is an inseparable part of the U.S. The measure would also instruct the governor and California congressional delegation to negotiate more autonomy for the state. A while back, we spoke with Yes California co-founder Louis Marinelli about this initiative for California secession. And a quick disclaimer to our viewers, Louis Marinelli is no longer the president of Yes California, but he is currently an advisor. Take a look. The Yes California campaign isn't just a secession campaign. It seems to be, like on the website, there's a list of issues that uh, that you remark are important to the Yes California campaign. So talk about how it's it's not just a secession movement, it's also a move, it seems to be a progressive issue movement as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, we, we hope to represent and speak on behalf of the vast majority of Californians. And so therefore our campaign, which is made up of Californians, is going to reflect the values of the people of California. And therefore, it goes without saying that our campaign is going to lean in a progressive way because our campaign is made up of Californians and the majority of Californians are progressive. And so we're proud about that. We support progressive values. We support things like the ability of an independent California to take aggressive uh, action against climate change, against man-made climate change, man-caused climate change. Uh, we want to be able to advance uh, progressive values around the world. Uh, we want to be able to get out of uh, America's uh, foreign agenda with its um, military agenda and its, with its wars and occupation and regime change, things like that. Rather, spend that money at home, uh, taking care of the people of California, improving the quality of life in California, uh, reducing the cost of living in California, rebuilding California. We rather spoke, focus that money on domestic issues that improve California rather than uh, waste it on attacking other countries. And, and we pay a lot of money to the American uh, budget every year that goes into the military budget. I mean, ten percent of the budget is usually from California, so that means, generally speaking, we're spending fifty, sixty, seventy billion dollars a year just uh, on the military. Uh, that's about two and a half percent of our GDP in California. If we were spending two and a half percent of our GDP as an independent country in California on a military, we'd have a military larger than Russia, even though their country is forty times larger than California. Uh, generally speaking, most countries around the world spend about 1% of their GDP on the military. The average military budget around the world is about $17 billion a year. If California did that, that would free up $40, $50 billion a year every year. Uh, instead of spending it on military, it could be spent on education, it could be spent on health care, infrastructure. People are talking right now about uh, you know, the dam in Oroville is, needs reconstruction. We're talking about a couple hundred million dollars for that. We're talking about freeing up tens of billions of dollars every year 
under that scenario, we have the money for the dam. We have the money for the high-speed rail. We have the money for the tunnels in the Central Valley. We have the money for universal health care. We have the money for uh, allowing for the next generation of Californians to go to university and, and uh, get, attain a higher education without taking out so much debt. We have the money for all that stuff, and we don't have to argue a bicker about uh, it because the money is there without raising any taxes or without funding any services. The political system is funded by big corporations, even on the state and local level. So is there a way to combat that as well? Because, I mean, for example, Jerry Brown was, is known as Big Oil Jerry Brown. So there's, there's corporate funding and, <clears throat> excuse me, and a lot of uh, corruption, even on the state and local level. Is there a way to combat that if you were to uh, move forward with this campaign? Well, there's a lot of uh, corruption at the state level, local level, county level. I mean, there's corruption everywhere. I mean, uh, one thing I think Americans need to realize, and I think that they're finally coming to do so, is that the American government and the governments that we have in the United States are just as corrupt as many of the other countries around the world. And for, I think for a long time, we were mistaken in thinking that somehow we were above that, that America was this pure democracy and our votes counted and all this other stuff. I think that it's, it's good to see that now more and more Americans and Californians have come to realize and accept the truth that corruption is a part of government, no matter where it is. If it's in the United States, California, Russia, China, France, all countries are going to have corruption. It's just the nature of the human human race. As corruption, when you have power and money involved, you're going to have uh, the corruption involved as well. So I certainly think that uh, we're going to continue to have corruption in California, even if we're an independent country. But what we can do and what we can pretty much guarantee is that we can re remove one level of corruption by removing the federal government corruption from our jurisdiction. And that gets rid of the corruption in the Senate uh, in Washington, uh, the lobbyists in Washington. I mean, there's going to be lobbyists in Sacramento. There's going to be corruption in the Sacramento Senate, but there's not going to be the American government corruption. So we can reduce corruption in California by getting rid of one whole level of corruption that's federal government. So it, with, with, in, in keeping with that uh, line of thought, is, is there a, are you thinking of restructuring any of the, any of how the, the government is set up in California from the state to the local level? Is there any sort of consideration, not just to mitigate corruption, but also to restructure and try to make it so that it's formulated more as a country and less just like a state would be that's part of a federal government? Sure. Well, starting in the executive branch, we're going to have to do some topical changes right off the bat in order to, you know, instead of have a governor, we're going to have to have a president. Uh, in fact, we have legislation already written, ready to go to do that. I mean, it would just have to be uh, enacted by the state government in order to happen. Uh, in terms of legislatively, we definitely want to reorganize the state government in a way where we can have, instead of have a two-party system that the Americans have created, it's certainly corrupt because it's, uh, in many people's eyes, uh, it, it only represents a small portion of the population. And the difference between the two parties is increasingly smaller and smaller as we go along. And so we want to move away from a system where we have two parties into a system where we have proportional party representation. Like most of the world's democracies actually employ some system of uh, allocation of representation in their legislative branch by uh, the percent of the vote that each party receives in the election. So something like that. Uh, California is a very diverse state. It seems that it's impossible to have everybody's diverse opinions uh, and needs represented by two political parties that are generally speaking very similar to one another. You know, this is something that they're talking about with Brexit, uh, and you mentioned Brexit on the site as well. Um, the economic factor. Obviously, California is in a unique position because you have a, a huge economy compared to other states in the union. But talk about what uh, what's going to happen with the economy and how do you see political and economic relationships with other states and indeed the rest of the country? Well, certainly, uh, there's going to be commerce is going to continue uh, between California and the other states. It's certainly not going to be the same country, so there'll be some need for uh, international agreements to be made. Uh, you know, people often bring up the issue of water. Uh, well, the United States has a water treaty with Canada where we talk about the production of power near Niagara Falls. When it comes down to it, the Americans receive so much uh, produce from California. There's about 20 or 30 staple fruits and vegetables that come from California pretty much exclusively. And if they're going to want to continue to buy grapes at the price that they buy them today, they're going to have to continue to make sure water arrives in California as it currently does. And so I see nothing more simple than a water for food treaty that could be signed, a trade deal, water for food. It doesn't get more simple than that. 
send us uh, water from the Colorado River as you currently send it, uh, and which the people of Arizona and the other states that receive water from that uh, basin currently have arranged their lives and uh, their economies along the lines of how much water they currently receive. So nothing would be changing for them. So they wouldn't be asking for more water, for example. So continue the status quo of the water exchange and we'll continue to send fruits and vegetables to the other states and people of the United States will be able to continue to buy their fruits and vegetables as they do so now. There doesn't have to be hostility or animosity between California and the United States. We can have a friendly and peaceful and cooperative relationship going forward. So what would you say to, to somebody who says that part of part of the job as an American is to stick with America and tr- like dissent is patriotic? And the idea that because of the current political climate, it's our job as Americans to stay, stay here and try to fix it and try to, for lack of a better word, unfuck it, uh, as opposed to trying to run away, whether that be running away to Canada or seceding from the Union. Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I haven't studied history in a while, but I, do, I think I recall that uh, George Washington was, was a military officer for the British Army before he was the American uh, general. And that'd be like telling George Washington to stick with it, uh, just because uh, we can fix it. Uh, we can re- we can reform the system in, in London from across the ocean. Well, we're, we're talking about trying to reform the system in Washington from across a thousand miles of mountains and deserts. People have been saying we can fix it, we can repair it from within, stay the course for decades, and uh, it hasn't been fixed, it hasn't been repaired. So. Uh, Like Einstein said, I think it was Einstein, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, then that's the definition of insanity. So I think it's it's time for something different. To learn more about the Yes California initiative, visit yescalifornia.org. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. Check out the last slide to see the sites mentioned in this week's show, also in the description. And be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. Also, for all of you podcast listeners out there, we also have a weekly podcast that comes out on every Friday, available on iTunes and Libsyn at actout.libsyn.com. Also, my book and I have performances and events scheduled in D.C., New York, L.A., and San Francisco. For more information on that, visit artkillingapathy.com slash performance. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to act out, visit patreon.com slash act out. We got nowhere else to go